geophysical tools to address a really wide range of problems. Uh, everything from marine volcanoes to archaeological sites mapped by UAS with the drones uh, to uh, environmental uh, uh, ground penetrating radar, you know, looking, uh, uh, they did a, a Oberlin mm -hmm. uh, Cemetery and Dix Park. So lots and lots of very interesting data. And another very exciting work that he has been doing is he is one of the leaders of unmanned surface vehicle facility where they have the unmanned boat that, is, uh, 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 that has a top equipment for data acquisition. So they did, for example, bathymetry here at Lake Raleigh and many other places. And today he will be introducing us to the fascinating uh, world of soundscape. Okay. Thanks, Eleni. Yeah, so I, I would call myself a geophysicist, so when I start to uh, dabble or explore new areas, it's always good to have collaborators. So there's a long list of people up here. Uh, Dave Eggleston, professor in uh, marine earth and atmospheric sciences. Not long after I got here, he knocked on my door, and, and people were just starting to look at the influence of sound on larval settlement, and we started talking about this stuff. But of course, like most professors, we didn't really get very far until we got a good PhD student. So Ashley Lillis came on board and did her PhD here in postdoc, looking at uh, the effect of sound on lo oyster larvae. Um, and then uh, Ashley's at Woods Hole now, and then Shannon Ritchie, who's going to be one of our new PhD students in geospatial analytics in the fall. Um, she finished her master's not long after that in 2015. Um, and then we also have uh, Pat Lyons, who's here today. He's been working with soundscapes down in the uh, Bahamas. He just finished his master's uh, a couple months ago. And Olivia Caretti is working in Pamlico Sound, um, looking at cult reefs, um, these newly restored oyster reefs, looking at the soundscape through time, and then uh, Kaylin Simmons, who I guess as class maybe teaching today, I think, uh, she's working down the Florida Keys. So you'll see little bits of work from all these guys probably scattered throughout here. All right, so if I told you that marine animals make sounds, this wouldn't really be surprising to anyone, right? Everyone knows about whales and dolphins and all that good stuff. Um, but it turns out if we go to the coast, particularly if we go to things like oyster reefs or coral reefs, what we think of as some of our ecological and economically most important sites. Uh, the soundscape is really dominated by invertebrates, things like snapping shrimp or lobster or crabs or even sea urchins. Um, and they make sound primarily either by snapping their claws or rubbing their limbs together or rubbing their body against the, the subsurface or uh, the seafloor. And fish. And fish, most fish in the shallow ocean have a swim bladder and they have a sonic muscle they can use to sort of excite that and make sound. And so that's what really what we're going to explore today. We're going to explore coastal ecosystems and how we can use the sounds by these invertebrates and these fish to understand the ecology. All right, so why do marine animals make sounds? Well, kind of the reasons you might expect, right? They might want to attract mates. Um, they might want to find food. Or they might want to scare off what's trying to eat it. Uh, some marine animals, of course, use echolocation to navigate. And others might just listen to the sounds of different areas to find habitat, right? And of course, the main reason we're talking about sound here in the ocean instead of light um, is that light doesn't penetrate very far in the ocean. So we went to the coastal ocean. We might see this is different wavelengths of light. You can see here 
on this slide, if you're in the coastal ocean, maybe we go down 20, 30 meters. After that, it's, it's pretty dark. We're out in the deep ocean, we can go a little further. Um, but light is, light is very limited. All right, so what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about how we record sound and how we use it to answer problems in marine ecology. And then I'll get into specifically call detection. So this is something that we've been working on uh, for the last few years now, how to use algorithms to actually detect the sounds of individual species um, and get more data-rich information out of some of these sound recordings than we have in the past. So we've been working with some template matching techniques that are really borrowed from marine seismology. It's really where my background is. And we'll look at uh, detections for snapping shrimp as well as oyster toadfish here at some local, fairly local sites. Then I want to say a little bit about machine learning and deep learning. This is probably the way we're going to move forward here with these approaches in the future. And then there's some great opportunities, also a few challenges, I think, as we work with these types of data and try to get um, more out of them. Um, so if you were a traditional marine ecologist interested in the coastal ocean and you wanted to say something about the distribution of animals or the biodiversity of an area or the health of an ecosystem, you might use one of these two methods. You might put out traps or nets. All right, and this, is, uh, this can be effective, but it's uh, labor-intensive, as Olivia can tell you. And if you don't believe me, you can go to the field with her next week and try to do it for a few days. Um, it's also destructive sampling, right? Whatever's in there is not going to survive. Um, some areas you wouldn't even be allowed to do this for fear that you might catch a sea turtle or something like that. So you might have unwanted bycatch. And no matter how much effort you put in out there, it's really just a snapshot of uh, what's in the area for a few days. Right? And not all animals can be caught or trapped, right? Some of these animals are cryptic. They're going to live in the crevices in the rock, and so this method is not going to be effective. Um, you might, alternatively, if you have good visibility, if you're working down in the tropics in a coral reef or something, you might be able to do visual surveys. Uh, this will work fine down there in, during the day, not so well at night. Uh, if you went off here in Pamlico Sound, though, and you dove down, you'd be lucky to see your hand in front of you. Uh, so it's not going to be an effective method um, in many environments, period. And again, it's very in labor intensive. Instead of integrating over a few hours like you might for the traps or the nets, uh, you're really looking you're a few days for the traps or the nets, you might be just sampling things for a few hours. All right, so what's an alternative that we can use? Well, the approach we've been taking is to put hydrophones out. Hydrophones are just underwater microphones. This is an example of an off-the-shelf instrument called a sound trap made by a company in New Zealand. There's one deployed in the Florida Keys in National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, and many of our moorings look like this. We've got this rubber-made uh, tub here that's been filled with cement and a little bar sticking out of the top, all right? So we're not actually anchoring anything to the surface. We're just setting it down there. And they tend to stay in place fine unless you have a Cat 4 hurricane. That's a, that's a different story. Um, and we just put this here and we record, all right? So typically we'll record about uh, 48 to 96 kilohertz, all right? So think of 96,000 samples per second. And that's sufficient to capture fish and invertebrate noise, as well as marine mammals and cetaceans. Um, we can record continuously, depending on the instrumentation. More often, though, because we're sampling at such a high rate, the data piles up pretty quick. So what we'll do is we'll turn the hydrophone on for a couple minutes, every 15 minutes, every half hour, and take a little sample of the soundscape. All right, so with this instrumentation, instead of being out there for a few days or a few hours, with the other sampling, we can leave these things out there for months or years. Right. Um, this little device here, which only cost about $2,500, will let us record for two or three months, no problem. Right. And again, it's fairly, fairly easy to deploy these things, comparatively to some of those other methods. Now, nothing's for free, right? There are some drawbacks of using sound. Um, we, have to, we have to have animals that are making sound, right? So again, it's not effective for all animals. And there's really no direct measurement of the size or anything like that, what you might get if we were actually trapping or doing visual surveys. And what we're going to get is a record of the calls of different species through time. Right? At least that's our, our end goal. And so that's going to be an indirect measure, perhaps, of the abundance. All right, so we all use sound. We're familiar with it, right? But maybe we don't think about a lot about what a sound wave is. All right? So a sound wave is a longitudinal pressure wave. And what that means is that if you look at the particles here, so if you look at this red dot as one particle, it's moving in the same direction as that wave is propagating. All right? So if your hydrophone is there at that red dot, what's happening? Well, you can see as the wave moves past, there are times when the black dots are close together, so things are getting compressed. There are times when the black dots are further apart. 
That's when they're getting expanded or rarefracted. And so that's what the hydrophone is recording, those small differential pressure changes that are associated with all the sources of sound that might be around us. And so when we record data, then this is essentially what we get out. Here's a short uh, sound clip. This is from the National Marine Sanctuary in Florida, the Florida Keys. So I got six seconds of data here, and we're going to be logging data in terms of pressure. Right? So this SPL is sound pressure level, and it's expressed in terms of 10 to the 6 micropascals. This is usually the units we use. And this is the, the measurement we, we might make over a short period of time. So we go ahead and just play this sound clip here. Okay, so you heard a few things there. You heard this crackling noise. Right? That's all snapping shrimp, little invertebrates that are closing their claw. We'll look at those uh, in a little bit. And you heard that thumping. It almost sounds mechanical. Right? That's, a, that's a fish. Right? That's a grouper making that noise. So we can work with this raw file. We can also do other things. We can start to filter the data. All right? So we might filter the data just to look at a low frequency band. So here, our instrument, we were recording sound that had frequencies between 10 hertz and 20 uh, 20,000 hertz in the raw, in the full data, we could filter the data into a band that's, say, 100 to 1,500 hertz. All right? And then we do that, what we see in this recording now is we see these fish calls. Right? That's really what stands out. That's what we're hearing here visually. Right? So we can analyze the data in these different bands. We could also filter a high frequency component of the data. Right? And when I play this, what are you just going to hear? You're just going to hear that snapping drum. Right? So, Fortunately for us, different animals vocalize in different bands, and we can do some really simple things like this um, to pull out these, these different types of sounds. All right, now, to get a measurement of how loud something is, what we do in acoustics is we, well, we can do different measurements. We're going to talk about the amplitude. So here's kind of a simplified sine wave like you might see in, in trig class. Uh, we could talk about a signal that's coming by, kind of a transient signal. Sometimes we'll talk about the zero to peak amplitude or the peak to peak from the trough to the peak here. Um, but more often than not, if we're talking about ocean noise, what we're interested in is some measure of sort of the average amplitude variation around, around the zero mean pressure here. Right? And we call that the root mean square pressure. So you can think of that as if we took the mean off the one of these time series here, so they were zeroed out, and we just calculated the standard deviation of all the pressures, that would be the root mean square pressure. Now, more often than not, if you hear anything about acoustics, you hear people talk about decibels. All right? Now, contrary to popular belief, decibels is not a unit of measure. All right? Whenever you have a decibel scale, it is always some measurement. It's a log of some measurement divided by some reference. All right? and it turns out the reference can be really important so, <laughs> and, and source of much confusion. So in uh, underwater acoustics and marine acoustics, we define the sound pressure level in decibels as decibels relative to one micropascal. Okay? Pas uh, micro being 10 to the minus 6. All right? And so we would calculate that decibels relative to one micropascal by taking 20 times the log base 10 of the pressure, in this case the root mean square pressure typically, divided by that reference. Okay? Now in underwater acoustics we use one micropascal, so that makes the math easy. Marine acousticians are lazy, I guess. All right? Um, in atmospheric acoustics, they use 20 micropascals. Why do you think they do that? They like to do math? Turns out that that has some physical meaning in, that, in the air, right? That's the smallest amplitude sound you could hear, right? So that's the, that's, that, that choice was made on perception. In the other water envi environment, that doesn't matter. We don't really have a, have a similar thing we want to tie it to, so we just use one a micropascal here for reference pressure. Now, I mentioned this... Uh, Primarily because this is a source of confusion. It turns out that when someone gives you decibels in water and decibels in air, they're offset by about 63 decibels. <laughs> okay? And so you might read news reports um, saying that such and such seismic source in the ocean is as loud as a Saturn V rocket. Probably not true. The person writing that article didn't understand that decibels is a, re is a relative scale. All right? So keep that in mind. This, this comes up in all kinds of fields. All right, so what can we do? We could take and calculate then this root mean square pressure um, in, in decibels for our, some time series. We can do it for the full bandwidth. We could do it for one of these low frequency bands or high frequency bands. And when we do that, we might do it just take what is the RMS pressure for each of our recordings that we're taking every so many minutes. All right? 
And if we do that, we get a nice image like this, where we can actually look at how sound pressure is varying through time. All right? So here is this sound pressure level in the 150 to 1500 hertz band. And this is for an area here called Middle Marsh, just off of Beaufort. Um, this is one of the areas that uh, Shannon worked on for a master's degree. And we can see this nice periodicity here to these changes in amplitude or sound pressure level over time. All right, we can do all sorts of techniques then to look at the frequency variation. The plot on the bottom is, is a wavelet transform. All right, and so this shows power here based on the color as a function of time on the x-axis, and then we have period here on the y-axis. So we had a period of one day. We see this significant power going almost all the way through here till we get to about the 4th of July in 2014. Okay? And then it picks back up again. So this tells us that fish are scared of fireworks. No. It tells us this is when Hurricane Arthur came through. Right? So if you were a fish living in Middle Marsh here in about, I don't know, two, three feet of water, and a hurricane was coming in, you would probably leave. Right? So it tells us that fish are, fish are smart. All right. So, so far we talked about how we can record sound. We can say something about how loud it is. Um, but ultimately what we're going to do is try to identify what's making noise. So when I tell people I work in acoustics, they usually have this picture in their head. They were sitting around listening to everything. And listening is, is fine. Um, there's, you know, I can get something out of that. But usually what we're doing instead of listening is we're looking at a visual representation of the signal in what we call a spectrogram. Right? Now spectrograms have applications in all sorts of fields. Um, you're going to have an x-axis here that represents time and a y-axis that represents frequency. So all of these are different fish calls or, or sound clips that have a lot of different fish calls in them. And they're all set to go from zero just to 2,000 hertz. All right? And then the colors tell us at what time and what frequency the signal or the time series has the most energy. All right? So red would be more energy and our yellows and then blues would be less. And so you can see right away, I won't, I won't play sounds for all these, I'll play a little, few more sounds later, but you can see right away that these calls coursing by silver perch or sea trout or to oyster toadfish, these all look different. Right? So often what we'll do is go through and try to identify times of coursing visually like this. Right? So you might think of this as an expert classification. So you can go through and say, what times of day are we seeing um, perch calls, silver perch calls versus toadfish or other fish. Right? So this is an effective method, but it's very time consuming to go and look at each file. And uh, Shannon's nodding her head here. Right? She did some of this work. Um, very time consuming. and uh, kind of very coarse, right? not very data rich. You can say if something is present or absent, you can kind of rank its abundance in the, in the spectrogram. Uh, we're not dealing with really a very data rich uh, uh, system of measurement yet. That's where we want to head. All right, so what we'd like to be doing instead of looking at these things is actually detecting calls, detecting calls from one or more animals. All right, so uh, when I say automatic call detection, what, I, what I'm saying is we want to pick up the signal, we want to classify it correctly um, with what species it's associated with, and then we'd like to be able to do things like measure its exact time that it came in on the hydrophone, its amplitude, and perhaps some other characteristics about that signal. All right, so that's where we, we want to go with these things. So we'll start with our first uh, kind of case study here, if you will, looking at snapping shrimp. All right, this is one of the first kind of call detectors we built. And the term snapping shrimp, there's no audio here. I'll play you some. You've heard some shrimp already, and we'll play some more in a minute. The term snapping shrimp really refers to a couple dozen different species from a few different families. There's no scale here, but there are maybe two to five centimeters or something like that. And they have one large claw, one small claw. And if you look at the video over here on, on this other side, you can see that this claw is closing incredibly fast. And in fact, it's vaporizing the water. It's creating a cavitation bubble. And that is, when that implodes, then we get this loud snap. All right, now why do they snap? Well, all the reasons you might expect, right? Maybe they just want to talk to their buddy. Maybe something's trying to eat them, all right? Or maybe they want to stun their prey. It turns out that this little snap from this little two to five centimeter shrimp is really loud, <laughs> okay? Uh, its source level, when we talk about source level, we mean how loud is it right at the source, um, is over 200 decibels relative to one micropascal. All right? That won't mean anything to you, but uh, it's louder than a blue whale call. All right? so this tiny little thing, by snapping its claw really fast, is creating a really loud sound. In fact, 
there are, at any moment in some place in the ocean, we can hear thousands of these snaps per minute. All right? And so that has profound effect on the soundscape. It is the dominant uh, organism that we'll hear in some areas. In fact, it can inter even interfere with things like sonar systems. All right? Our people who do tags, telemetry tags, for tracking fish these days have a problem if they're in shallow water with a lot of snapping shrimp, the tags don't work very well. So there's some practical applications to understanding this. Right? So snapping shrimp were known to influence the soundscape for a long time. You can go back to early papers. Um, people were worried about acoustics back in the 60s, mostly for naval research. Uh, you can find references to snapping shrimp and how important they were to the soundscape. But very few people had really tried to count them, right? How many snaps are happening? Um, perhaps because in some cases it seems over overwhelming, the number that are coming in. Uh, we had a very long time series, a hydrophone out for a year, between uh, uh, 2011 and 2012, uh, at West Bay. West Bay is one of these subtitle oyster reserves that are put out by the Department of Marine Fisheries. And they started putting these out in the, in the mid-90s. I think West Bay went in about 1996, so it's been out there for a while. It's a really healthy ecosystem now. You have these sort of marl pounds, uh, mounds here that are a few feet tall, laid out in a grid like this. Right? And we had a hydrophone near the center of this site that recorded um, uh, about a minute or a ha half a minute to a minute of data, uh, depending on how long the deployment was, every 15 to 30 minutes. All right? So we had a really long time series. And at the time, this was the longest sort of high frequency uh, sampling anyone had done. It's still one of the longest ones. All right? So here's the spectrogram then for the, a little chunk of data recorded at West Bay in September of 2011. And again, here is time. So we're going to look at 10 seconds of data. And then here is frequency going from 0 up to 25,000 hertz. All right, so all this red that you're seeing, these are all broadband signals coming from those snaps. Right. And here's the corresponding this pressure time series. This sound clip's a little loud here, so let me turn it down to start with. Okay, so you can hear a few fish in the background, honks, honks, okay, but mostly what you hear, it sounds like rain or popcorn, that's thousands of snaps rising at the hydrophone every minute, all right, so this is what we wanted to try to, to quantify, more than saying, yep, those are snaps, we wanted to see if we could do more with the data. So to do that, you can't look at 10 seconds of data, you actually have to get your nose down on the waveform a little bit, and so what I'm showing here is an arrival of just one single snap going from zero to two milliseconds, okay, two milliseconds. Um, and so you can see the flat here, and then we see this little bump coming in and this big bump, all right. This is that initial displacement of the water and then the collapse of the bubble, all right. But it all happens incredibly fast in just two milliseconds. We can, now if you look at this in, in detail, we've got this general shape here, then there are lots of little wiggles around it. Turns out with any instrument, any kind of acoustic measurement, what you record is a function of the source, but also the propagation path. So if things are bouncing off the seafloor or the sea surface, things vary a little bit. So the approach we took was to kind of generalize the signal a little bit by taking an envelope. All right, so you can think of an envelope as just being, if I were to square this, make it all positive and sort of low pass filter it, or in reality we do it with something called a Hilbert transform. It, it doesn't matter. Um, too, math doesn't matter too much right now, but you can see how this is sort of captures the energy coming in as a function of time. And it's a little bit more general uh, framework than what we have here. So this would just be the envelope for one snap. Now what we did is we went and we looked at lots of snaps. We took their envelopes and we stacked them together and we smoothed them a little bit and we started to get this idealized shape of what we think the envelope of a snap should look like. Okay? Again, this is all incredibly short time here. This is two milliseconds. And once we get that sort of characteristic template or kernel, what we're going to do is we're going to slide it along an envelope of the entire data entire time series, and we're going to find where it matches. So this envelope, this kernel here, if we lay it over one of those snaps, right, this has a correlation coefficient of 0 0.82. Right, so pretty good. The shape is preserved. Right, so we can now use this to actually slide this kernel around all of our data and pick out times where something with this general shape, very impulsive onset and so kind of oscillating decay where those signals are coming in. So that turns out to be a really powerful tool. And so if we do that here, I'll show just one second of data, all right, because there are so many of these snaps coming in. The time axis here now is one second. If we were to slide the envelope of the, the kernel envelope with the data envelope along, then we would get a series of 
detection scores, all right, correlation coefficients. And we could set some threshold here. We've used uh, 0 0.75 or 0 0.7, one or the other here. In a, every time this correlation score gets above this threshold, we declare a detection. All right? And if we overlay those detections on the waveform or on a spectrogram, we'll see, yeah, we're doing a really good job here. We can pick up all of these, even some of the more subtle ones you can see here just have a little bit of energy. We can pick those up. So we're now getting uh, the exact time of each snap coming in. And importantly, we're also getting information about its amplitude. Right? Once we find that, we immediately go in, take an measurement of how loud it is. And so this is a much more data-rich approach um, than just saying, yeah, there were snapping shrimp in this file. All right, so what can we do with this type of data then? Well, here's our, I mean, you said we had a really long time series here. So it's going from uh, summer of 2011 into the summer of 2012. And this is a snap rate and snaps per minute continuously through time. All right, we see we had a few data gaps or we had a few instrument failures and things like that, but that's all right. We can see generally we have almost a whole year worth of data here. And we see this nice pattern through time. All right? Higher in the summer months, lower in the winter. We can also then look at that sound pressure level. Right? How loud was each of, the, or each of those uh, 30 second or one minute recordings through time? Now we can see, we don't just say anymore that, oh, yeah, when it snaps more, it's louder. Right? Now we can say quantitatively what the relationship is between the snapping rate and the sound pressure level in different frequency bands. So we can make quantitative measurements. And then we can also start looking at what are the drivers of these snapping rate changes. All right? So the red line here is hours of daylight. All right? So of course, there's more hours of daylight in the summer than the winter. And the blue line here is water temperature. All right? So the first thing that jumps out when we made this plot, of course, is that we have all these kind of jumps here in the snap count. Each of those is correlated tightly with some change in water pressure. All right? so here we were able to show that not just on a seasonal scale, but even on a time period of a few weeks where we might have currents moving through the estuary, um, changes in water temperature have a significant effect on snap rate and also sound pressure levels, how noisy it is. All right, so then we can start making relationships. So I can say, now that I've got the snap detector, we can say that for every uh, Every increase of 465 snaps in a minute, oh, sorry, every, every, uh, yeah, every increase of 465 snaps in a minute gives me a, a change here. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> the snap rate change here, we see that we get 465 uh, micropascals uh, change for every snap per minute we get. All right, so that's, that's a way to quantify that. Um, so we can actually make predictions then, if we increase the snap rate, what will that do to the change in sound pressure level? All right, or over here, we could say that for every degree change in uh, water temperature, we might expect 137 more snaps. So we can begin to quantify these things. Now, the story gets more interesting um, if we zoom in even more, rather than just looking at sort of this annual time scale and doing these correlation plots. Um, we can look at what happens during just a few days. And we can look at what happens during just a few days per season. So the gray bars here are nighttime periods. All right? And so these dashed lines are right at midnight local time. And the black here is showing us snap rate, again, in snaps per minute. And the blue here is showing us water temperature. So throughout much, much of the year, there's not a strong diurnal signal in terms of water temperature. It doesn't change that much night to day. There's a little bit here this period in the summer. Um, but you can see that there are big swings, or re relatively big swings, between night and day that have nothing to do with water temperature. It just has to do with the light availability. And what's really interesting is that the pattern changes throughout the year. So if we look out here in the spring, we see there's a lot of snaps right after dusk, then sort of a lull right before dawn. Uh, but by summer, that pattern changes to prom predominantly snapping at night. Then if we go to the fall and into the winter, we have periods, long periods, where there's more snapping happening during the day. Okay? And so uh, this, this is opening up more questions, and we, we can ask questions now that I guess we couldn't even begin to ask before. Right? Why are snapping shrimp snapping? <laughs> um, 
And so we applied this method. We have in our lab and, and colleagues have in other places now. And it turns out everywhere we look, if we look in uh, mid-latitudes here, if we look in the tropics, there's always a pattern. Uh, the pattern is often different. <laughs> and it can change from sites that are just a few tens of kilometers apart. Right? So um, this is one thing we're trying to understand. What are actually the drivers of snapping? What is the purpose of snapping? Is it the same for every species? And what else influences it other than temperature and, and perhaps light availability? All right. So that's one example of what we can do when we actually start counting things. Um, let's look at another uh, case study here. That's of an oyster toadfish call. All right. So this handsome devil is an oyster toadfish. All right. And if you look like this, you would probably have to make a lot of noise to attract a mate. All right. This is not going to come to your nest willingly. You've got to make some noise. And an oyster toadfish sounds like this. <coughs> Okay, so that, that's all it takes, apparently, if you're a toadfish. <laughs> love is, e love is easy. Um, and here's a spectrogram of that sound. You can kind of hear when it was going, it's harmonic, right? It sounds more like a trumpet or a horn. And so it has these, this, this here, the, the start time is arbitrary, but this is 10 seconds of data shown down here. And these red little lines here are harmonics. Here's one just above 200, and then it's harmonic at 400. If I showed you more of the spectrogram, often we can see a third and a fourth harmonic going up here in frequency. Sometimes they're led by this little grunt noise, but then we have these nice kind of slightly downward sloping uh, packets that go, go on for about a third of a, a second or so. All right? So these are what we wanted to try to detect. Um, the area where we're going to look at this is in Chesapeake Bay. All right, so just north, north of here, Harris Creek, Maryland. And it turns out if you go from North Carolina, where we had all those snapping shrimp, just a little bit north, the snapping shrimp disappear. All right, so we go out of their geographic range. It's a little too cold up there for them. And so we look at these recordings. We don't hear any snapping shrimp. Um, and during the period we were sampling here in, just in May, of, um, uh, May of 2015, um, soundscape completely dominated by those oyster toadfish calls. All right, so here in, in this part of the Chesapeake Bay, these little dots represent oyster reefs. All right? And the black ones were areas which had been restored, meaning someone had gone out there and spent a lot of money to put new shell material down. And the red ones were old ones that were not, uh, not restored. All right? So we were able to put hydrophones out for about a month at, at all of these and try to see what we could say about the habitat for um, these areas. All right. So how are we going to use template matching to detect toadfish? Well, we take a slightly different approach, but the same general idea. Here we've got the spectrogram, right, so time and frequency. And what we're going to do is we're going to make, instead of making that uh, kernel like we have for the snapping shrimp, we're going to make a kernel that's in spectrogram space. All right? So we've got these little bands here that we generate that have positive and negative parts to sort of do noise, uh, increase the signal and noise when we do the correlation. We're going to correlate this little image, more or less, with the spectrogram image. All right? So we're just going to slide this across here all right? and see where that template matches the spectrogram. And if we do that then, all right, here's the detection score and then these dots are the, points, the peaks in that detection score in black or here's, a, here's the detection score by itself down at the bottom. Uh, the values here aren't, aren't normalized, so one has to pick a threshold in which they want to uh, call a detection. All right, but we can see we do a really nice job of picking out each of these toadfish calls. So again, we're getting quantitative information about the time and if we want the amplitude of each of those calls. Now there's a little bit of a, a hitch with toadfish because the frequencies of harmonics can change. And you can see that just by looking through the data that they're not always the same. So what we do then is we make a bunch of these kernels. Right, here's just three examples, one that has a harmonic at 149 hertz, one that has one at 208, one at 266, and there were 30 or some total that we used spanning, spanning the range we needed. Um, but we match all those kernels with the data and look at which ones match the best. Okay? So now we get not just detection time, not just amplitude, we also get the frequency of the call. All right? So again, much more data-rich approach than just looking at these spectrograms. So for a month at eight sites, uh, we detect 1.2 million toadfish calls. All right? So it's hard to kind of get your head around. Uh, 1.2 million toadfish calls. Uh, 
And we can set the threshold by actually subsampling the data, looking at some files. And it turns out if we set that threshold for the texture score high enough, we can estimate what the false positive rate is. All right? So it's about 1%. All right? So this does a really good uh, method. And of course, um, there's no way to get information on 1.2 million calls manually. All right, so here's one way to represent that data then. We can have uh, time here on the x-axis, and now what we plotted is the fundamental frequency of those boat whistles. All right? And so for each day at each, at each eight sites, we've done a data density plot here showing what the frequency is through time. All right? And immediately you can see it has this sort of periodic behavior right? with different sort of periods in there, those long wavelength stuff as well as these short wavelength stuff. And what do you think that is? Well, turns out it's water temperature. All right? So the snapping shrimp, the rate of snapping depended on water temperature. It turns out for the oyster toadfish, the rate never changes noticeably or significantly when the temperature changes. What does change is the frequency. All right? So a fish or an oyster toadfish is exciting its uh, swim bladder using its sonic mus muscle. The frequency at which that muscle contracts depends tightly on water temperature. All right, so like most great discoveries, though, someone had looked at it before. All right. uh, but it turns out no one had looked at it in 40 years, <laughs> or almost 40 years, which is a little strange. So if you read a paper on oyster toadfish, uh, you would see this reference to an old paper by Fine from 1978. And uh, he had, I don't know, a couple dozen data points. Right? It wasn't easy to do back then. He had to go out in the boat, put a thermometer over, and take a little piece of recording on tape. and analyze it by playing it back through some kind of spectrometer or something, you know. It was challenging. They had a few points. They had points from Delaware, had points from South Carolina, Virginia, all over. Um, here again, we had 1.5 or 1.2 million calls, uh, which I've displayed here as average, daily averages, all right? So we get a much different look at what we're seeing. Now our line is different than Fine's, all right? Um, so that, that's interesting. It could be that different populations respond slightly differently to water temperature. Could be that at different times of the year, um, the frequency dependent changes. Or could be that the frequency dependence has changed through time. That's not all the question. There are animals that we can see even in the course of our lifetimes have changed the frequency they call. The famous example is blue whales in the Pacific have shifted their, their tone. Right? So again, with this, this automated approach, now we can start to look at these questions at a whole different level than we could before. All right, so what else could we do with this stuff? Well, we can certainly use it to estimate the onset of spawning. All right, remember that male toadfish is calling just because it wants uh, to find mates. So we can see we just barely caught the onset of it. We had a few very low call rate days here. Then most of these sites shot way up. Um, there is some, some pattern here to it, to the call rate. It doesn't seem to be related significantly to water temperature, but it does seem to be the same across these sites, which is interesting. And what you'll see is that on average here, the restored reefs are higher call rates than the unrestored reefs. Right? We would uh, uh, interpret this as meaning that the restored reefs have more structural habitat. The toadfish live in these nests, and so they need structure to do that. Right? And so here's an indication that a restoration project, an oyster restoration project, is actually providing um, improved habitat for at least one species here. All right, so we could keep marching along. We could take one species at a time, developing a detector. Right? I, eventually, I'd like to retire. So we probably, probably need to do uh, something different. All right? So the future of all this is probably some form of machine or deep learning. All right? and when I say machine learning, I'm really talking about statistical learning. So I'll show just a simple example here of where we started to head with some of this. So here's a spectrogram here of a silver perch call and a trout call. And again, these are really short time scales. This is a tenth of a second that I'm showing here. And the blue line here is the pressure, and the red lines of both of these are the waveform envelopes. All right? And so if you looked at these two signals, visually, we could look at them, right? You could probably uh, train a small child to say, this is trout, this is silver perch, if I showed them these images, right? Intuitively, we get it. We, we can learn this. Um, but if I try to go and use some of the approaches we've been using, like if I look, try to look at energy, where these signals have their most power, kind of here in the 500 to 1,000 hertz band, well, I'm probably going to check both of these, right, if I'm just using some kind of detection method. So if I take the envelope of both of these signals and try to pick peaks of the envelope, I detect silver perch, 
and I detect sea trout, all right? There's no, I can't tell them apart. So what I need to do is, having made those initial detections, right, I see that there's a signal coming into the hydrophone, it meets some criteria that it may be a fish call, then I need to do something to it, right? I need to figure out what it is. And that's the, that's the important part, not just the detection, but the classification. So how might we do that? Well, once we've identified these calls here, in this case, there are different ways we could do this. I've used most simple here, just picking peaks in an envelope. We want to do some feature selection. All right? So if I, in this case, if I take very simple features, like I take the ratio of power in different frequency bands, if I look at the skewness or kurtosis of the envelope um, for each of these little signals here that I've pulled out, I look at the number of times the signal crosses the zero axis, all right? very simple things, I can then feed them into a statistical learning routine. Right? And the simple one that most people or many people here are probably familiar with would be just the decision tree. Right? The same kind of approach that's used all the time for image classification. And so this was a, a little example where we had this period where the perch and the trout were sort of coursing one after the other. Right? So we had an example where I went through and manually labeled a thousand perch calls and about 700 sea trout calls. And as a professor, that's all I can stand to do by myself. Okay, but it gets us started. And if I just take and split those up half for a training data set to decide what decisions should be made, how to use those features, right, and half for validation, we see we do quite well. Right? We get a, a false negative rate of 1 or 2%. Right? So this, I, this is always my favorite diagram, confusion matrix. Right? How confused are you? Right? So, so the true class here, perch, all right, 98% of, uh, of the ones in the validation that I had labeled as perch, it was able to pick out as perch. All right? um, uh, and the, our 99% of the ones I had labeled as trout, it was able to pick out as trout. All right? So this approach is viable. Now when we start to scale this up to longer time series, it's not going to be this simple. I picked a nice short piece of data where I had these two calls, but it's possible. Okay? But ultimately, I don't want to make decisions probably on what the future classes are, and I have my biases. And so the future is probably some sort of deep learning approach. And this is what's used today for image recognition. Right? So um, not too long ago, image recognition was done with some sort of computer vision where uh, you were trying to pick edges in images and doing some kind of algorithm. Right? Today, most image recognition is done with uh, a convolutional neural network. Right. So the idea here is that we just put in images. So I could, instead of putting in features, I could pull out a spectrogram around those calls I had detected, the perch or trout. I label a bunch of them. All right. These hidden layers here, these are all a series of filters, or convolutions that are being done and pooled in different ways. And we run it through the first time. It doesn't do so well. Right. Uh, but then the system goes and it tries to adjust the weights. Right. It tries to decide which of these uh, which of these operations is most important, and it learns. Right? And so this is, this is probably where we're, we're going to head with this eventually. Um, it can be done for any type of image. It's done for many images today, so there's no reason we couldn't make it work for spectrograms. Um, but there are some challenges. <laughs> okay? uh, learning, particularly deep learning, takes lots of labeled inputs. All right, so the first uh, option is always to get an army of undergrads and lock them in a room with snacks. All right. That's one approach. Uh, the other approach, you want to think a little outside the box, might be to do some sort of uh, crowdsource labeling. All right. So all those years when you were filling out things that said, I'm not a robot, right? you were typing text. Sometimes you were clicking on stop signs or things like that. Guess what? You were training Google's deep learning algorithm. And you did a great job. Right? Google made a lot of money off of your effort. All right? So it's not unreasonable uh, that we could get people to volunteer to do this labeling. Right? It's not like I said, it's not hard. You can tell one from the other. Right? So if we could present the data to people, that's a possibility. The other thing we might be able to do is data augmentation. Right? And that's a fancy way of saying mess with the data a little bit. Right? I, add, I pick a bunch of calls, I label a bunch of calls, but then I add some noise. Right? I change the pitch a little bit. Right? So I don't need to label so many things. I just need to tweak, uh, tweak them a little bit. Um, the other challenge, of course, is that we have a lot of data. Right? So we typically record at um, up to 96,000 hertz uh, samples per second. And at 16 to 24 bits, um, you can do the math for what time frame you want. You get a lot of data real quick. All right. uh, the good news is that now we have these really awesome GPUs, all right? graphical processing units. And they're not really for lighting up pixels on the monitor anymore. 
they're actually for doing deep learning. They're doing they're for doing cross correlations. Right, the kind of things we want to do. So, um, we're, I think we're at the stage now where the GPUs and the software framework that goes on top of them is at the stage where this becomes practical. So. Um, Parker was not doing deep learning the other day. He was doing some basic clustering, and he had been working on something that was taking 10 hours on his desktop, and you got it down to what, 10 minutes? or <laughs> Less than 10 minutes on the HPC, which has just added some enterprise class GPUs. Right, so these things are becoming possible these days. All right, so, um, so there are also, I think this is a, a great time, particularly if you're a student, there's a lot of opportunities um, to use data. A lot of free data these days, right? There's so much free data, it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, NOAA and the National Park Service have recently started this ocean noise reference station system, right? So the National Park Service has had a, a, a land-based noise monitoring system for a while. You might have seen their noise map. Um, and now there's an effort to put hydrophones out long-term at these sites all over the globe. And these are going to record at only 5 thousand hertz, 5,000 samples a second. That's still enough to look at uh, most fish calls. All right, so these data are openly available here at the National Centers for Environmental Information, NOAA. Uh, the National Marine Sanctuary Program is also just now putting in hydrophones at some of the marine sanctuary areas. And these are going to sample at uh, at least 60,000 hertz, some maybe even higher. Uh, right now, they've been, so far, they've been sampling continuously. They may have to change to something more like the schedule we use, I think, because the data gets bigger and bigger. Um, but this was actually uh, facilitated or is being facilitated as a result of a lawsuit that NGO filed against the Navy right, for, for noise problems. So this is one of, the, one of the conditions that NOAA starts doing this monitoring at these sanctuary areas. And again, uh, this data will all be openly available. Right. And to get a little more general, NSF has been funding for the last several years a Ocean Observatory uh, Initiative. It has a lot of pieces. It's got some um, deep ocean moorings. It's got these coastal pioneer arrays. Where we've got gliders and instruments out on the seafloor. And in here, even in the Northwest Pacific, off the coast of Oregon, we've got a cable that's actually run 200 miles offshore to a volcano. We've been looking at seismic data <laughs> for the last few years. And on part of this, they've been adding now digital hydrophones, high sample rate hydrophones. Right? This data is just coming in. There's also data on uh, temperature, there's live video streams from high def, there's ocean current data. Um, you want a data set, it's there, um, you just have to download it. Chances are no one's looked at it, okay? The amount of data is, is staggering. So I'll, I'll leave you with this, but um, if you're looking for data for class projects or you're trying to decide what you want to actually even do for your thesis, uh, think about some of these, these big data problems that are out there. Uh, very few people are, are dealing with these massive data sets that we're paying to collect. Uh, a lot of it's just sitting there. Right, thanks. Well, thank you. I think we can open the floor for questions. Yes, please. So, Bill, I'm just sitting here wondering about ways to get spatial information. And it occurs to me you could put out arrays of hydrophones, and if you had arrival time information, then you could use triangulation. Or maybe you could use, yep. I don't know to what extent a snap and shrimp is a standard candle. They always have the same action, but you could use the attenuation as a, it's probably marker to get the distance by attenuation. Yeah, so, so that, that's a good point. So everything we've been doing so far, those hydrophones, they keep time. They sort of keep time like your PC does, right? Not great time. So we're looking really at time series. Um, there are, yes, there are ways to uh, have more accurate timing. So we've been using, before I started doing this, I was using hydrophones for years to locate earthquakes. Turns out when the earthquakes happen in the ocean, they generate noise that scatters at the seafloor and gets into the sound channel and can go a long way in the ocean. So those hydrophones actually have had, at the, what were the time, the best clocks. Today they would have atomic clocks in them to get synced with GPS. So there are, are ways to do that, that sort of thing. And the other, other way, the way the Navy did it originally, um, would they would not just have one hydrophone, they would have really long arrays with close spacings and they would do beam forming. They would actually look at the angle of the signal coming in. So all those things are um, still possible. The thing, that, the thing that's interesting is a trade-off, right? Um, little instrument like this, this is one of these sound traps. It's got, here it's got an extra battery pack on it. Like I said, the sound trap is 2,500 bucks. <laughs> so we could put a lot of them out really cheap. Uh, the hydrophones we were using, deep ocean hydrophones we were using for earthquakes and stuff were 20, 30K to build, right? So yeah, that is the trade-off. Do you want more point information? Do you want to be able to locate things? <laughs> 
Yes. You mentioned that the blue whale had changed its frequency band in recent years. Is that like an evolutionary strategy that a lot of species undertake in order to like dominate like in a canopy? In a <laughs> well, well, what's interesting is this has been a, a point of uh, much discussion. When I say it changed its frequency, it changed it by a couple hertz. Uh, from 28 to 30 or something like that, you know, over the course of several decades. And so your natural reaction is to say, oh, it's changing its frequency because it's noisy. Well, it's just as noisy at 30 hertz as at 28 hertz. So why it did that, we don't know. Um, and there may be, there, and we look at different subspecies of uh, different whales, often they have slightly different calls. And so we barely understand that for marine mammals, and, and I still don't think we understand it at all for fish. So like the toadfish, our, our slope of temperature and, and frequency is different than what fine found in 78. It could be the toadfish has changed its call frequency. It could be there's different subpopulations. So I don't think we know, we know why. <laughs> gotcha. Jay? Yeah, no. One of your early slides you showed a, a loss of signal due to the hurricanes that came through. How does that fit? Um, and you're monitoring kind of a, health, a healthy reef, I guess. Mm -hmm. Are they using it around the well rigs? Note a, a sudden loss of signal as being evidence of a contaminant? Or a yeah, most, um, most rigs and most marine construction now has some sort of noise monitoring, uh, mostly for you know, impacts on marine mammals and things like that. Um, hydrophones are also used in uh, engineering to look for leak, leak detection and things like that. So yeah, I think that on a on an oil rig, um, certainly down on the rig part, there would probably be monitoring, but uh, that data is rarely released, and I'm not sure that it's... Yeah. Suddenly you stop hearing the ship, you stop hearing Some, And so that is one of, the, one of the things that we're trying to do. So Olivia is working in these culture reefs, sort of the reverse problem, right, where they've gone out and put this shell out, and we want to see how those reefs recruit animals through time, right? So put the hydrophones out right after the reefs are established and see how the animals come. Um, or if a big storm comes through and sand buries the reef, right, you know, what does it look like afterwards? Yeah, so pe people are working that. We're sort of working in that direction, although maybe not the oil uh, industry route, but same idea. Yeah, Russ. Sure. Yeah, great presentation. Yeah. Great. So what do you think about possibilities for creating spatially continuous soundscapes? Is that of, of interest? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's one of the ideas with this sort of noise reference map here. You've, you've probably seen the National Park uh, maps for, for atmospheric acoustics, sort of. And, and so uh, people have tried to do that, have tried to take hydrophone sites and sort of uh, grid them together. Right now we're, we're fairly uh, limited. Right? The, ocean's, the ocean's a big place. Um, but even within a reef, like we would go to uh, an oyster reef or a section of coral reef, so far what we've been doing is putting maybe one or two hydrophones down. And that is another kind of unanswered question. What is the spatial variability within even a, an area? And so I think if we had instruments that were time synced, like what Walt suggested, we could start to do that. And that could be really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, along those same lines, what is the spatial footprint? Uh, I mean, it must vary depending on the frequency. That's, that's right. So it varies on the frequency and also on the water depth. So out in the deep ocean, um, the, set, there's the sound velocity changes with depth because of temperature and pressure. So in the deep ocean, there's what we call a sound fixing and ranging or SOFAR channel. So I could put a hydrophone out in the middle of the Pacific, and I could hear iceberg noise from Antarctica. We've done that <laughs> experiment from big icebergs breaking up. Uh, so it gets in there, it travels a long way. If we're in shallow water, we're working here in three or four meters of water, then we might be looking at fish calls coming from you know, tens or hundreds of meters away, so a much smaller area. So if we really want to look at the spatial, how spatially continuous it is, we're gonna need, we need a lot of instruments in the shallow water environment. But they're cheap. They're cheap, right. <laughs> We've got that. <laughs> Oh, why well, there are gaps here? Yeah. It turns out when you, you can always turn something on. You can always throw it in the ocean. You don't always get it back. And when you do get it back, sometimes it doesn't have data on it. So, um, so yeah, those are just times when we, the hydrophone failed. And occasionally that, that happens. So we were doing here, this was, these were early days, so the recorders have come a long way, these little off-the-shelf recorders. The very first batch we bought 
we could record a minute of data every half hour, and maybe we could record for about three weeks. So we first started t doing this, these recordings. Um, Ashley was going out every, every few weeks and recovering the hydrophone, downloading data, and putting it back out. So it, through time, they've been able to record longer and longer, and it's become less, less labor intensive. But uh, here, this would have been one, pretty much one deployment that was lost. Here's a period of another deployment that was lost. So, and again, it was, a, it was the case where we had one instrument. This was sort of our pilot project when we first got started. Are you volunteering? Yeah. <laughs> um, would you just be differentiating between the two species for like a certain region or? No, I, th I think the, the, the most, the, ideally what we do is we would plug the waveform in, plug the entire spectrogram in, it would give us an answer, I think. In the short term, what we'll probably do is, is look at a, a kind of narrow range of frequencies. Like I might look at things making a noise between 0 and 4,000 hertz and at a, at a given site, that might be a dozen species over the course of the year. All right? And so this learning algorithm would not just have to be able to deal with two species. It would have to deal with 12. Right? And that's, that's a solvable problem. Right? I can do image classification now. There are, there are algorithms which can differentiate you know, hundreds of different things. Well, maybe not a few, a few kilometers. I would say that each, uh, each area would have, might have different species. So it's unlikely uh, we could not just build a detector here for Pamlico Sound, right, where we've got a certain population of animals and then deploy it in the Keys. Um, we would have to go there, look at what animals are present, and, and label a set of images for there. Um, but yeah, it, it's not that we move you know, a few kilometers away, but it's if we change geographic areas, we have actually different populations. If we give, give the algorithm uh, a call it doesn't know, it's going to try to classify it as, as something. Right? So either we have to have a category of, of nothing that it, we train it on. You have, basically, you have to train it. It won't know what it, it doesn't know. So. Like like yeah, so bo boats would be part of that. Um, so boats, it didn't show any boat noise here today. Boat has a very distinctive pattern in a, in a, in a spectrogram. And so we could, you know, we could label, yeah, we could label you know, a couple thousand uh, spectrograms with different kinds of boat noise in it and feed those into the detector. And that would almost certainly be a, a class that would come out. And that's another application of this, right? We could, we could use this algorithm not just to look at ecology, but actually to look at anthropogenic activity. So, all right. Related to that, how do you find other things to build back to the space you look for, like just looking for different types of structures? Yeah, so there are, there, are, um, there are things we see in the data all the time, but I don't know what they are. All right, so that's the first thing to realize. Um, just because I don't know what caused it doesn't mean I can't classify it, right, if it's consistent. So that's good news. Um, the problem with, yeah, with any kind of machine learning approach or any detection approach is occasionally you'll see something you didn't expect, and then you have to backtrack and add that to the training data set. So it is, it, I think these things are an iterative process, um, and it's, it'll be a, a long haul. But I think we're at the point now we can get started on these things. So you that right now, the, the late... Yeah, right now the labeling, you know, we've just done a little bit here so far. We're doing it manually. Um, and so that's the challenge. Um, certainly some things, like I have a really good toadfish detector, right? And we have a really good snapping shrimp detector. So I don't actually have to do those manually. I can give you 1.2 million toadfish <laughs> examples to plug in the training data set already. So some things we don't have to do. Um, but a lot of these things, like, you know, this example here, um, these are hard to, you know, build a kind of template matching routine that's easy to, easy to, to tell them apart, all right? So we may have to actually go in and, and human label a bunch of files at least to get started. And that's the, again, that's the case in any learning approach. Yeah, got it. Uh, going off of that, did you mention if you held a threshold for that, for that matching? Like if you have like a minimum uh, correlation coefficient? Yeah. So uh, the way the image correlation is done for the toadfish, uh, it's not normalized, all right? But what we would do is we would... Uh, we would go in after, afterwards and look at I don't know, 100 different files or something like that and go through and see when the detector got the right answer or when it got the wrong answer. Right? So there, 
and that's what we use to set the threshold. All right, so we, we would automatically, at first we would do detections with the threshold set really low, right? Then we would look at a few hundred files and go in and see which ones were not real toadfish calls, right? So there's some expert intervention here still, and then we adjust the threshold, right? And that's how we can get it up. We actually have pretty good confidence that our false detection rate is less than 1% because we went through that exercise.